If it's Tuesday, backlash and blame. President Biden speaks out as Senate Republicans backtrack on their own bipartisan border bill, while House Republicans face a razor-thin vote to impeach the nation's top immigration official. Plus, a federal appeals court rejects former President Trump's claim that he has absolute immunity from criminal prosecution, setting up a likely Supreme Court showdown. And an unprecedented verdict. A Michigan jury finds the mother of the Oxford school shooter guilty of involuntary manslaughter in connection with her son's 2021 mass shooting. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Yami Shell Center in Washington, where today this nation's broken border and broken Congress are on full display. Right now, the House is debating a historic impeachment of the country's top immigration official, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. While over in the Senate, a bipartisan border bill appears to be collapsing under the weight of Republican backlash. President Biden spoke from the White House this afternoon. He accused Republicans of bowing to pressure from former President Trump. All indications are this bill won't even move forward to the Senate floor. Why? A simple reason. Donald Trump. Because Donald Trump thinks it's bad for him politically. He'd rather weaponize this issue than actually solve it. So for the last 24 hours, he's done nothing, I'm told, but reach out to Republicans in the House and the Senate and threaten them and try to intimidate them to vote against this proposal. And it looks like they're caving. Those remarks come as House Speaker Mike Johnson doubled down on his assertion that this, that this bill will never be considered in the House. Right now, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is still planning to bring this deal to the floor tomorrow or Thursday. But the Senate's top Republican, Mitch McConnell, who advocated for this bill just yesterday, has now reportedly told Republicans they don't have to vote for it. And Wyoming Senator John Barrasso, chair of the Senate Republican Conference, released this statement, quote, President Biden and Senator Schumer will never accept the significant changes required for American safety and border security. I cannot vote for this bill. Americans will turn to the upcoming election to end the border crisis. Earlier today, the top Democratic negotiator said there's no hope for the package. The top Republican also expressed his frustration. For this package in the Senate? No. Republicans have definitively sided with Donald Trump. They have decided they want to keep chaos at the border because it is a political winner for them. My issue is we all see that there's a problem. My response back to them is, okay, go negotiate something because we can't just sit here and do nothing. So if you disagree with the bill that I brought out as the beginning product that we don't want to amend that, then go sit down with folks across the aisle because I don't want us to just look at each other for the next several months and to say this is unattainable. We've got to solve it. And as we mentioned, right now, the House is debating two articles of impeachment against DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Republicans accuse him of failing to enforce immigration laws and secure the southern border. A final vote on the articles will come once debate has wrapped, likely later this afternoon. But it's unclear if they have the votes. At least two House Republicans have said they will vote against the articles of impeachment, arguing it sets a bad precedent. Here's Republican Tom McClintock. I think that it lowers the uh, grounds of impeachment to a point where we can expect it to be leveled against every conservative Supreme Court justice, uh, every future Republican president and cabinet member, the name of the Democrat state control, and there'll be nobody there to stop them because we will have been complicit in redefining the, the fundamental definition of impeachment uh, that the American founders placed in our Constitution. NBC's Ryan Nobles is on Capitol Hill with more of this. Of course, Ryan, is a crazy news day. What's the latest, though, on this border bill, and how much could this bill dying be a sign of defeat, of course, for Senator Mitch McConnell, who just yesterday, we said, was advocating for this bill? I, I think we'd be really wise, Yamish, to, to read into this, that this is a bigger problem going forward for the Senate Republican Conference and their ability to govern. You know, for a long time, we've laid a lot of the blame of the dysfunction in Congress uh, in the hands of the House Republicans, but we're starting to see a lot of that behavior starting to mimic itself on the Senate side as well. And in the past, it was always Mitch McConnell that was able to corral uh, the kind of wayward members in his ranks to bring them together for an important piece of legislation. 
that had bipartisan priorities, of which there were Republican wins. This, I think many people would argue, is an example of that. This is a border bill where Democrats uh, offered up a lot of concessions that they would have never, never normally offered up in negotiations like these under normal circumstances and didn't really give much back. For instance, there's nothing in this legislation for Dreamers, and yet it's still not enough for Republicans, def despite McConnell encouraging them to, to vote for that. Even a year ago, a McConnell-endorsed bill would have brought along with it 20, 25 Republicans without even lifting a finger. So Mitch McConnell's future as the leader of, of this conference is certainly an open question, but broadly, there's much bigger questions about whether or not this body can effectively function on any level. Well, as you're talking about whether or not this the, the Congress can function. Of course, there's Senator Schumer, who is offering to move the vote. How much did that tell us about Democrats and really President Biden, how much they want to get this bill passed? Yeah, I don't think that there's any doubt that this is a major priority for Democrats. It, and the border piece is, of course, the, the thing that we're talking the most about. But this is, don't forget, a four-prong national security supplemental. In addition to the border package, it also includes a critical aid to Ukraine, which is a massive priority for the Biden administration and for Majority Leader Schumer. It also has that funding for Israel and also um, funding to help the situation in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, this is something the Biden administration considers a principal priority. The reason that it was coupled together with the border security package is because they thought that's what it would take to bring Republicans into the fold. That turned out to not be the case. It's been a disaster. They're going to have to come up with a plan B if they hope to get any parts of this national security supplemental passed. Well, as you're talking about this, I mean, there's House Speaker Mike Johnson, who, of course, has also said that the bill is dead on arrival when it comes to the House. We heard a slightly different rationalization from the Speaker today on that. Why is that significant? Well, because it seems as though every time we talk to them about their border security priorities, uh, it seems that their narrative is changing. In the beginning, it was, we have to pass something immediately. Then it was, if we're going to pass any aid to Ukraine, it's got to be tied to funding for the border. Then when the package came out, they said it didn't go far enough. Now they're saying that this package would actually hurt the situation at the border. Listen to what Speaker McCarthy, or I'm sorry, Speaker Johnson said earlier today. They did not send us a border security measure. They didn't. They sent us a supplemental funding proposal that has immigration reform, but not real border security reform. And so that's why it's a non-starter. So now they're, they're calling it a non-starter. It effectively means that there's no room for negotiation here. Basically what House Republicans have said, it's either their original bill, H.R. 2, which is a, a very, very strict, very tough immigration reform bill that Democrats have said there's no chance of getting 60 votes in the Senate or nothing. So it seems as though, Yamiche, when it comes to border security, the answer here, at least for this Congress, is nothing. I also want to ask you about the impeachment vote on... Alejandro Mayorkas, do Republicans have the vote? What's the math looking like? It's going to be super tight. You know, they, it's going to depend on who shows up here tonight, but our best guess is that uh, Republicans can only afford to lose three votes. There are two members who have definitively said that they cannot vote for impeachment. There's at least another universe or three or four that have been squishy in whether or not they plan to vote for it. If one more of them break away, there's a chance that Mayorka survives this. So we're going to be watching closely at 530 to see whether or not this bill even makes it to the floor, because my guess is if they don't think they have the votes, it'll either be delayed or outright poll. But right now, Republicans are telling us they think the votes are there. Ryan, thank you so much for all that reporting on Capitol Hill. Thank you. Joining me now is Oregon Democratic Senator Jeff Merkley. Thank you so much, Senator, for being here. Um, as we said, the bipartisan border bill, it appears to be dead after President Biden, of course, brought in a lot of Republican demand. So what do you think Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer should do now? Should he still bring it to a, to a vote? Well, it's such irony here, because the whole package that involved the Middle East and Ukrainian humanitarian, the Republicans said, it has to have a border bill. And they put one of their most conservative members in charge of that, James Langford. He worked incredibly hard with, with Chris Murphy on our side and a, and a few others. And, uh, and so it got delivered. They reached a, a deal, a deal that the Democrats certainly would never have written uh, on their own. And suddenly, here's Trump saying, 
oh, we don't want a border deal. I want this to be an open sore, an open problem through November. So we have this open border mentality among the Republicans. In 2013, we had bipartisan support for a massive bill, including lots of border security. Republicans torched it in the House. In 2018, again, Republicans torched uh, border reform. Now we're in 2024. They're torching it again. They want a broken border, which is, is of course, the opposite of what they argue to the public. And it's the frustration is just enormous. I understand that, Senator, but what should Senator Schumer do about this? So there are a couple of uh, pathways. One is for us to have multiple votes and keep the, the border in the news, keep uh, bringing it forward to accentuate the fact that President Biden has put forward a very large package now accentuated by this deal, now a $20 billion deal for Customs and Border Protection, for asylum officers, so there's timely uh, 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 asylum hearings, uh, case management programs, all kinds of, of pieces to essentially completely change the dynamic on, on the border and keep bringing that up. A second piece of this puzzle is that it is absolutely essential that we consider Ukraine. We are at a Munich moment. When, remember 1938, Chamberlain goes to Hitler in, in Munich and says, you can take a big slice of Czechoslovakia and we'll just declare peace in our time. We are at that very moment now on Ukraine, where failure to fund the armaments that uh, Ukraine needs, breaking the coalition and, and the unity with, with Europe, means we're essentially saying to Putin, you know what? You, you go ahead, you, 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 you run over the top of Ukraine and we'll just look, look the other way. That would be a massive, massive mistake. So I think what's going to happen is we're going to attempt to do both in some formulation. Uh, that is get Ukraine uh, to the floor and try to get a positive vote and, and uh, save the coalition with Europe backing them, uh, but then keep bringing up the border as, as well. I mean, here is the House saying, we're going to impeach Secretary Mayorkas because he's not doing a good, good enough job on the border. And here's $20 billion bill with all kinds of improvements uh, in um, the support structures. And they're saying, yeah, but we're not going to give the, the secretary the power to actually act effectively on the border. It's, it's, it's beyond insane. Sanity. Well, Senator, would, it sounds like you're saying that you would vote for this bill as it is now, but would you also vote for standalone? So would you vote for both if it came up as it is now or if it, it got bro broken up into different pieces? Listen, the, uh, the <laughs> big, that is really the way it should be, right? It should be broken into pieces so we'd have a competent legislative dialogue on, on every component of this. Uh, I do want to see an amendment uh, process on, on the floor. Uh, I, am, 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 I truly believe that we have to make changes in our, our border policy. Uh, I think the, the real emphasis where I put it on it is, yes, security at, at the border. You have to have a prompt, and by prompt, I mean the six-month range. You have to have asylum hearings, not six years. Right now, the whole world has gotten the message that if they come to the southern border, and we, you know, tons of people coming in, even from places like like China and say the word asylum and then proceed to give a story for the, the critical fear test, uh, they get five or six years before there's a hearing. That's but Senator, I, wanna, I guess I want to make sure I, clear, um, I get your answer. Would you vote for it as it is now if it came to the floor of this border bill? Uh, I would work very hard to amend it and improve it if it came to the bill. But I do think that if we have bipartisan work uh, found on this foundation of this border bill, uh, that that it, I, I think that it's in, important that we change the current dynamic on the border. So it sounds like you wouldn't vote for this bill. Well, it As sounds it like now. I'd work to amend it to a point I'd be comfortable uh, uh, su supporting it. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with many uh, provisions in here that, that undermine kind of the basic tenets of the asylum in a way that was unnecessary to do, except that it's a grand compromise with Republicans. Sometimes you have to lump a lot of pieces that you really think need to be improved. But first, as a senator, I'd be committed to trying to in improve them and then wrestling with what that final package looks like. But uh, I do believe we have to act to change the current dynamic on the border. I also want to ask you about the f future negotiations with all this back and forth with Republicans getting on this deal, then saying actually they don't want to do it. Does it make you less likely to want to negotiate in the future with Republicans? 
Well, in the Senate, any policy bill takes bipartisan work. So you always have to negotiate. You have to have 60 votes to close debate. Now, of course, I'm a um, leading advocate of reforming the filibuster uh, so that there's an incentive for both sides to compromise. But in the absence of that reform, you, you, you're you going to have to have huge, extensive dialogues to uh, try to reach a, a common agreement for the good of the country. So, so the answer to the question is no. Uh, you have to keep working to have a conversation across the aisle. I want, to, I want to also ask you about our latest NBC News polling. We found that the border is one of many issues where President Biden trails former President Donald Trump. He's also head to head against Trump um, in a potential rematch. He would also be trailing him. Are you concerned about the president, President Biden's political standing right now? If you're not concerned, you need you're not paying attention. Uh, the the strategy of uh, of uh, authoritarianism that Trump represents, uh, what his commentary has been about the people he'd hire to basically run the country exactly the way he wants, regardless of the checks and balances in the system. This is scary stuff. We've watched many democracies go off track around the world. We are at great risk, and so yes, I'm extremely concerned. And there are big issues in the world that we have to figure out. We have have to figure out Ukraine and the Middle East and the border, but also the fundamentals for working families, the cost of housing, the cost of drugs. There's so much we could do if we had a Senate and House determined to fight for American working families. Senator, I want to ask you about one other poll that stuck out to us. 76 percent of respondents said they're concerned about President Biden having the necessary mental and physical health for a second term. Do you share any of their concerns? No, I think he's doing a, a really excellent job. We passed such a huge amount of, uh, of marquee uh, legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, the, the finally a massive bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill to in, invest in in America, the first ever uh, a set of negotiations on drug prices. I think all drugs should be negotiated for all Americans. So we have a long ways to go to get the standard of other developed countries, but we finally broke the ice on on that piece so there's a, a lot that has been working right uh, and we need more of that what we don't need is an authoritarian uh, who wants to dismantle our democracy well thank you so much senator for joining us and sharing your thoughts pleasure to be with you take care Let's now go over to the other side of Capitol Hill. Joining me now is California Democratic Congresswoman Nanette Barragan. Thank you. She is, of course, the chairwoman of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Now, Democrats are united against this Mayorkas impeachment vote, but it looks like it's going to really come down to the wire for Republicans on whether or not they have the votes. Is this going to be, you think, in your opinion, if this impeachment goes through, do you think that this could open up future impeachments to, for, for cabinet officials and others to be impeached because of ideological disagreements? Well, that's the concern here, is that this is merely a political stunt. It's merely a disagreement Republicans have with Secretary Mayorkas and what he's doing on the southern border. And I want to remind your viewers uh, that uh, this is a secretary uh, who has asked for additional resources. The president has asked for additional resources on the southern border. It's Republicans that are saying no, that we're not going to give you more money. We're not going to give you the resources to deal with the southern border. And so in one breath, he's asking for the resources and then Republicans are saying, no, we're not going to give it to you. We're going to impeach you instead. Um, it's a lot of hypocrisy and just goes to show you they're not serious about the border and they're not serious about fixing this. And clearly they're taking their orders from Donald Trump. And I want to ask you, I mean, it's a hypothetical question, but if this precedent was, was there, if there had been someone from the cabinet impeached, would you have possibly tried to impeach someone like former Attorney General Bill Barr? Well, you know, I think about the situation when uh, Secretary Nielsen was separating children and, um, and their families. Uh, we were outraged, uh, but we didn't say, let's go impeach her. Uh, again, this is looking at uh, and using policy as opposed to a high crime and a misdemeanor. Let's focus on those situations where you do have evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, and Congresswoman, I want to also ask you about this bipartisan border deal. It sounds like you've been pretty critical of it, but tell us where do you stand on it? And would you urge Senator Schumer uh, against putting it on the floor this week? Well, uh, we are hearing now from Republicans uh, that they uh, are for stripping out the border provisions and having a separate foreign aid um, 
uh, vote. And that's something actually the Hispanic caucus with the tri caucus has been calling for from the beginning. Uh, so I would support uh, having a, either a vote on the original uh, border supplemental uh, as it was with uh, Ukraine and uh, Israel and Taiwan money, or I think the better option is to just uh, carve out the border and immigration in a completely separate vote, a separate conversation. That's how we're going to get to a real negotiation. This was a hostage taking, right? This was Republicans in a room saying, well, you want Ukraine money, you want this other foreign aid money, so we want you to give us changes, permanent changes, bad permanent changes on immigration policy. Those, this was not a fair negotiation. This was not a fair outcome. And we can see that just by looking at the final product. And Congresswoman, you just called this a hostage taking. So I want to ask you, how concerned are you now that this has been one of the most conservative border deals that was already up, up for vote, up for um, consideration? Are you concerned that future deals could get even more conservative? Well, absolutely. I think uh, it's been stunning to see the rhetoric change um, and that Democrats have been for uh, making sure we're fighting for immigrant communities, making sure we're fighting for comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, look, we're willing to make tough compromises, but that comes along with pathways to citizenship. Nobody's talking about the dreamers. Nobody's talking about the fe people who've lived here, uh, who are now doctors, who are lawyers, who need these protections. It's bipartisan. 70% of the American people uh, support this, yet they're being left out. Uh, so we can have tough conversations about coming up with solutions, but there's got to be a real give and take here. And that did not happen in this situation because it's being combined with other topics like foreign aid. And I want to be clear, Congresswoman, would you vote for this bill if it did end up coming to the floor? No, this is not something that I could support. Um, remember, what we've got here is we got permanent changes to the asylum system that take away due process rights. Um, there is some uh, good stuff in the bill, uh, but what we're giving up here is nothing, uh, n provides no pathways. And again, we need to have that in, in a fair deal and a humane process. And I'm concerned that some of what's in this bill would make the situation worse, uh, not better. We know what happened under Title 42. We saw uh, the largest numbers of apprehensions. Uh, so for us to go to something similar to Title 42, I don't think it's going to fix and solve the problem at the southern border. And make no mistake, Republicans don't want to fix this. They want the chaos. And of course, uh, Donald Trump wants the chaos because this is something that he's campaigning on. And he wants the images, which is why I think Republicans Republicans won't even give the president a penny of money for resources. And it sounds, I want to ask you about our NBC News poll, but I want to ask you quickly, you would vote, it sounds like, for a standalone bill if it was for Israel aid or for foreign aid. Uh, yes, I, I will prefer the vote that happened um, on a foreign aid bill without any border policy or immigration policy in it. And our new NBC News poll had President Biden essentially tied with President Trump among Hispanic voters. Um, President Biden won that block by more than 30 points in 2020 as the head of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. How do you explain that? And what's your advice now for President Biden as we're looking at these numbers? Well, first of all, uh, we have to do a better job of going out and engaging our community. The Hispanic Caucus has been on the road in the last year doing that, but we've got to continue to do that and do more of that. And we've got to see the president out there uh, talking about what we're doing uh, for our communities, what we have done. There's been so many wins in the last Congress for our communities, but people don't hear about them. They don't know about them. And part of that, I think, is because there were so many. So whether it's you talk about the largest expansion of veterans benefits um, and health care to veterans, uh, that people maybe not know about, whether you talk about the lowering cost of prescription drug prices, people are not feeling yet because it hasn't gone into effect. People need to hear about that. And if you take a look at the issues that Latinos care about, it's about the economy. It is about lowering prescription drug prices. It's about health care. And so we need to go and talk to them and tell them about what we've been doing, but also what we are going to continue to do. Student loan is another area where the president has been doing all he can to make sure to provide relief. That is something our our communities need to hear about. So we need to engage them early and often and all year, not just in an election year. And that's something I'm going to continue to make sure we're asking that the president do. But we also have to do that as members of Congress. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Congresswoman Bar Barragan. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for having me. Coming up, what's next for former President Trump's legal strategy after an appeals court rejected his claim for absolute immunity? Trump's former lawyer joins me here in studio next. Plus, if it's Tuesday, 
Voters are voting in Nevada's unusual presidential primaries without Donald Trump on the ballot, at least not until Thursday. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We are following breaking news tied to the special counsel's election interference case against former President Trump. A federal appeals court has denied Trump's claim that he's immune from prosecution. Trump argued he had blanket immunity from any acts committed as president. The, tree, the three judge panel adamantly disagreed, saying, quote, it would be a striking paradox if the president, who alone is vested with the constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, were the sole officer capable of defying those laws with impunity. In a statement, the Trump campaign said it would appeal the ruling in an effort to prevent the trial from proceeding. Now, the judge overseeing that trial has dropped the original March 4th trial date from the calendar to give this appeals process time to play out. NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian joins me now. So, Ken, where does this appeals process head now? Well, you mean uh, the court has given uh, former President Trump and his lawyers until Monday to appeal this to the Supreme Court. They could also ask for a full hearing on bank from the D.C. Circuit. But in that instance, um, the court said the ruling would not be stayed. So their best bet really is to appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, former President Trump has already indicated that's the direction they're going in. And then the question becomes, does the Supreme Court agree to hear this case? They may not. They may say, you know, this 57-page unanimous opinion um, stands on its own, and, and they may leave that alone, and that would become the law for this circuit. And in that case, uh, the case would go back to Judge Tanya Chutkin's courtroom, and, and presumably it could get back on track, and we could see a trial uh, perhaps by May. If the Supreme Court does agree to take the case, then everything depends on how quickly they schedule oral arguments and how quickly they can turn around a ruling. Yimish. And you just broke that down, but I want to. You said the best bet is to go to the Supreme Court. So, based on this timing, do you think that this trial will definitely start before Election Day? You were talking about maybe May, if, if the Trump team goes straight to the Supreme Court. So it just depends. If the, if the Supreme Court declines to take the case, then the, the trial would definitely, uh, by all appearances, unless something else derails it, uh, be on track to start even as soon as late April or May. If the Supreme Court agrees to hear this, though, then, you know, it, it could be, it could be, if they, they could do it on an expedited basis, they could turn it around in a month, or it could be many months, or it could be, you know, until after the election. So it's a real wild card. Um, whether this case gets to trial before voters decide uh, who's going to become the next president. Wild card, or definitely two words to use all that's going on here. Um, I want to ask you, of the four trials Trump is facing, how many, if any, do you think could conclude before November? So it seems like the New York state case is likely to get to trial perhaps first now because this election case has been derailed in Washington. Um, and. It, it, you know, it seems like that that's likely to conclude and there will be a verdict in that case, if not a sentence, before the election. Of course, that's the case that's brought by an elected Democratic prosecutor that's sort of seen as the least credible by critics and, and the most potentially political and, and, and the least serious in terms of uh, the conduct alleged. Although it is, you know, this is about the hush money and whether uh, a former President Trump, you know, made a, an illegal campaign contribution in paying off a porn star to cover up an affair. Uh, uh, this is stuff that voters have already factored in, and we've known about this for years. But that is the case that seems most likely to go to trial uh, the soonest. Well, thank you so much, Ken, for t talking about all the different legal challenges that the former president has. Thanks. You bet. I'm joined now by Tim Parlator. He is a former member of Trump's legal team. So thank you so much for being here, Tim. So where do you expect Trump's current lawyers to head next now that this ruling has come out? I think that they're going to go straight to the Supreme Court on this. You know, the, when the mandate came down and it said this will be stayed uh, for you to go to the Supreme Court, but not if you go for a rehearing on bunk, I think that gives them a clear path to go straight to the Supreme Court. And you previously said that you didn't think that Trump would be successful arguing full immunity, but right. you said at, that there's a chance that he could win at trial for a partial immunity argument. Do you expect the Trump's legal team to make that, that kind of argument? Yeah, I, I do, because one of the things in this, uh, in this ruling is that it presumes everything that in the indictment is true. And so it doesn't provide you know, any wiggle room for him to argue uh, factually, which is you know, one of the features of doing a motion at this time without an evidentiary hearing or anything else. So a lot of those arguments, if they can show that it, that it was not 
you know, the way that the indictment says that it was within the scope of his responsibilities, that'd be something that they have to bring out at trial. And so it is something that could come back, I believe, after trial. I also want to ask you about the strategy of just delaying. Um, is there a strategy there to do that? And do you think that that strategy could continue after this ruling? I mean, look, I, it's not something that we did at the time that I was there, but um, and so I don't have any specific knowledge, but it does seem like everybody is rushing the clock. You know, Jack Smith is trying to bring this case in record time. You know, a case like this, of this complexity, this many documents, over a million dollar, uh, documents in discovery would normally take two years mm. to bring to trial. So I think that there is, you know, some gamesmanship really on both sides of playing the calendar based on the election. And so, you know, just as much as Jack Smith's trying to rush this case, uh, so too with the Trump team trying to delay the case. Mm -hmm. and, and interestingly, I was actually expecting the circuit to uh, reject this appeal based on jurisdictional grounds and say, yeah, it's not proper at this time, come back after a conviction, which would have, you know, really removed the ability to take it to the Supreme Court. And so by ruling it on the merits, it does open up that opportunity for them. It's interesting. Um, I also want to ask you about the classified documents case, because you sure. said that that's possibly one of the biggest threats to, to former President Trump. Do you mm -hmm. still think that and, and why? I do. Uh, and that's based on my evaluation of the facts. Uh, so I think that there are legal issues involved in this case and certainly the Alvin Bragg case. And, uh, you know, Georgia seems to be falling apart on its own at this point. But I, I think that the Mar-a-Lago case, if everything in the indictment turns out to be proven true, that's the one that I think would have the most difficulty overcoming an appellate challenge. Mm. Uh, so that that's why, particularly the, all the stuff in there about the obstruction, I, I think that's that's going to be the heaviest uh, lift for them. When you look at that case, could you think that trial could conclude before Election Day in November? Not based on the current uh, track. You know, the, the current track, they seem to be trying to push the January 6th case, you know, for that one. And, of course, you've got the, the New York case. It's probably going to go first. I also want to ask you about this idea that if Trump is elected, there are some people who would say he would pardon himself or he would move to dismiss all of these legal cases against him. What are your thoughts there, especially as someone who's worked on his legal team? Do you, do you think you expect him to do that? Uh, you know, I don't know what he would do. I mean, a self-pardon is a really unprecedented uh, thing. It's never been done before, and so therefore it's never really been tested uh, for the legality of it. Um, and so I, I don't know what he would do there. Certainly a new attorney general, uh, even if he doesn't direct the attorney general, hey, dismiss the case against me, a new attorney general could look at this thing and say, you know what, I take a very different view of this than Merrick Garland. Uh, Jack Smith, you're, you're wrong, and they could dismiss it. So e even if it is not something that comes directly from the White House, it is certainly something that could happen. Well, it's great insight from someone who, of course, was, again, on former President Trump's legal team. So thank you so much um, for joining us, Tim Parlator. Thank you. Up next, guilty count, guilty on all counts. We have the very latest on today's historic verdict, convicting the mother of a high school shooter. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We are following breaking news out of Michigan, where a jury has just convicted a mother in connection with a school shooting carried out by her son. Jennifer Crumbly was found guilty on four counts of involuntary manslaughter. The convention comes more than two years after her son killed four students in a shooting at Oxford High School. He is serving a life sentence without parole. Now, this is the first time in U.S. history that a parent has been held criminally responsible for a mass shooting carried out by their child. NBC News correspondent Adrian Broadus joins me now from Pontiac, Michigan. So tell me, uh, Adrian, I mean, there's this is in some ways, of course, a big, big historical case. So what's been the mood there since this verdict was read? Just to set the scene for you, Yamish, today is a day of exhale for many of these families who have been inside of the courtroom over the last week. They've been waiting to see how this jury uh, would essentially vote in the manslaughter trial against Jennifer Crumbly. Shortly after the verdict was read, I spoke with the father of the youngest of the four that was killed back in 2021. Her father is Steve St. Juliana. His daughter was Hannah. 
Here's what he said about today. What is on your heart today? Uh, I guess the, the the first thing is relief. The biggest piece is, is relief. I'm very relieved that the jury came through um, and with the verdict that they did and that there's finally some accountability. There's so much more um, that needs to be addressed, but this was a very good first step. Without accountability, there is no change, and that is what, I mean, myself and the rest of the families are after. So that was the reaction from one parent, and he also shared with me it's not a matter of if, but when this happens again, saying even though there was accountability in his eyes inside of the courtroom today, he fears there will be another mass school shooting. By contrast, I did speak with some legal experts who have been following this case. One attorney told me that what happened at the courtroom today is dangerous. He says it sets a dangerous precedent, and he says that the the jurors were overwhelmed, in his opinion, by their emotions. Whatever the case, this jury found Jennifer Crumbly guilty on all four counts of involuntary manslaughter. And Adrian, and I mean, Adrian, as you interviewed that father, I mean, you could feel the relief in his voice. You could hear the relief in his voice. Was this community expecting a conviction in this case? You know, people that I heard from really didn't know. Some families who had students, uh, specifically parents, they were hopeful. They wanted justice in their eyes. They did want someone to be held accountable. The prosecution argued over this week-long trial that Jennifer Crumbly was grossly negligent, saying that she could have prevented this shooting by, one, addressing her son's mental health issues, two, not taking her son to the shooting range or even purchasing him that gun. And something the prosecution used against Jennifer Crumbly was Ethan Crumbly's own words. There was a journal, 22 pages with handwritten notes. He talked about shooting up the school. He talked about needing help. He even sent a friend messages via text saying, I need a therapist, but my parents won't listen to me. Now, by contrast, when she was on the stand, Jennifer Crumbly took the stand in her own defense. She said her son never exhibited signs of needing a mental health professional. She said he did suffer from anxiety surrounding big tests, and he was worried about what he was going to do after college. Her son is serving a life sentence in prison without the possibility of parole. Yamish. Thank you. It's important to note, of course, that Jennifer Cromley's husband is also going to stand trial in March. So we'll be watching out for that. So thank you so much, Adrian, for your reporting. After the break, meet the deciders. We're live in Reno, Nevada, talking to key voters as they hit the polls today in the state's Republican and Democratic primaries. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. You know what we like to say around here? If it's Tuesday, voters are voting somewhere. And today, that somewhere is Nevada. In the state's presidential primary, President Biden faces little competition on the Democratic side, but the Republican contest is more complicated. Donald Trump's name isn't even on the ballot in today's Republican primary, underscore primary. That's because Republicans and Trump allies in the states decided to award Nevada's 26 delegates based on the results of the state's Republican caucus on Thursday. And Trump is the only major candidate participating in that contest. NBC's Steve Patterson joins me now from a polling site in Reno to sort this all out. So, Steve, why is this state having two contests this week on the GOP side? Uh, you mean because the state GOP decided to create a caucus. It's really as simple as that. Nevada typically, traditionally, has been a caucus state. That is changing this year because of a law that gained bipartisan support that said that the state can have a primary. They did it for a few reasons, primarily to gain uh, a little bit more voter retention. You know, you can drop your ballot off. You can send your ballot in. You can mail it in. You can bring it in. You can do whatever. They wanted to open up the state. The GOP said, no, we want to control it because we're 
were worried, in their words, about voter integrity. And so they established a system where Trump's on the ballot. They invited all the candidates to join in. They're awarding the delegates simply for that caucus. And no get delegates if you want to stay and hang out on the primary. That's what Nikki Haley's doing. She's fighting for essentially zero delegates, while Trump is fighting essentially his own race for the 26 delegates that are available. They're both fighting for headlines. And that's why we have two. Himish? Such a such an interesting and frankly confusing system there. But how have the yeah. realities on the Democratic and the Republican side affect the turnout today? Who are you seeing? Well, let's just get the Democrats out of the way. I think the reality is sort of inevitability, right? It's Trump and, or sorry, it is, it is uh, Biden and Marianne Williamson, and that's really it. And so Biden will win this in a landslide. There's not a whole lot to talk about. We, we talked to a few Democratic voters. I think the only other thing that they're battling is sort of apathy. There was a few voters I spoke to who said they, they wish there were simply more options. They wish there was more of a fight and maybe another alternative to President Biden. Meanwhile, on the Republican side, there is a vast amount of confusion. One guy was just in here not too long ago, maybe five, ten minutes, and he's like, my candidate is literally not on the ballot. I think he was joking because he wanted to be able to support Donald Trump on all the races that he that they possibly could on, on every single ballot. But there are legitimately some confused voters who get these mail-in ballots, see Nikki Haley's name and not former President Trump's name, and, and wonder what's going on. There was a significant messaging campaign campaign from the state GOP to try to get people to recognize that there not only is a primary, but there's also a caucus. There's also another campaign because Nikki Haley is still on that primary. She will win. She won't win any delegates, but she will win the headlines to try to vote for yeah. none of the above because you can do that in Nevada. Another interesting twist in all this, but at the end of the day, Trump will get these delegates here. Well, well, thank you, Steve, for breaking all this down, this confusing pattern here. Yep. And up next, the current president's age, the former president's legal problems. We'll dig into the biggest concerns from voters and brand new numbers from our NBC News poll. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. There's one word that can summarize how America feels about a Biden-Trump rematch in November. It's concerned. Voters are concerned about President Biden's age. Three quarters of all voters, including almost half of Democrats, are worried about 81-year-old President Biden's mental and physical health in a second term. That compares to 48 percent of voters who say they are concerned about former President Trump's mental and physical health. Trump is 77 years old. The bigger problem for Trump are his legal issues. 61 percent say they are concerned about Trump's civil and criminal trials. And those trials include, of course, multiple felony charges tied to his attempts to overturn the 2020 election. Joining me now is my panel, Rhonda Colvin. She's a Capitol Hill reporter for The Washington Post, former Democratic congressman from New York, Joe Crowley, and Brendan Buck, former advisor to speakers John Boehner and Paul Ryan, and of course, an NBC News political analyst. So thank you all for being here. I want to start. Rhonda, what do you make of these numbers? Well, I think one of the, the stunning things in the poll to me was the number of independents who say they are concerned about Joe Biden's age. It was 81 percent, I believe. Um, that's pretty high. I mean, I'm, I'm no social scientist, just a journalist, but that seems pretty high and I think probably concerning for the Democrats. I think uh, there's also a perception issue, just like the economy, where people say they're concerned about the economy, yet the numbers look pretty strong. Um, these are uphill battles I think the, the Democrats are going to have to overcome in order to have people engaged in this election, have turnout be high, and I think at the end, in November, we'll probably really be examining the turnout numbers because that, that's going to be everything. Congressman, how does President Biden convince people that he gets up for four more years when his own party is, is concerned about his mental and physical health? Well, I think you saw him today responding to the lack of progress on a, on a border bill, speaking eloquently, speaking very forcefully as well. Well, you know, with, with age comes sage. You know, we've said that before. I do think, though, that when it comes to November and after all this said and done about Donald Trump and his continued uh, legal issues and potentially going to jail for uh, insurrection, that people are going to come home. Uh, and uh, look, you know, 
uh, you can't change anything about age, nor can Donald Trump change anything about his age either. And they're very similar, three years apart. There's not a big divide here in terms of that. So I do think when all's said and done, it's an issue, but one that can be managed. See, I, I hear that a lot. We, we talk about that Donald Trump is actually not that much uh, younger than, than Joe Biden. But I think people look at Joe Biden and they just see this is an older man, much, much older than, than Donald Trump projects himself. He seems to have much more energy. And we, we can say that they're, they're close in age all we want, but I think people are seeing and it's showing up in polls that Joe Biden has slipped. And it's not just he's older that, you know, we re remember him from the Obama administration. He was much more vibrant or, and, and, and had much more um, energy back then. So it, it's there. I don't think you can change that. What you can do is change the subject. And I think what you're getting at is you need to make it about Donald Trump and make him unacceptable. You're never going to win that argument about age. Just make Donald Trump an unacceptable alternative. And, and there's that's illegal the solution. numbers. I mean, obviously, there's, there's the numbers with the legal problems. Exactly. Right there. Yeah. I mean, the, he has so many vulnerabilities, whether it's he's a, a chaos president, but also just go back to the issues. Abortion is, is something the Democrats are going to be able to hammer Donald Trump over the head with. I mean, those are ways, other ways you can make him uh, unacceptable that go beyond the, the, you know, the chaos that we're, we're familiar with. Can I just add, just to the energy portion of that, though? Mm -hmm. Donald Trump is bombastic. I mean, Donald Trump is an attacker. Donald Trump is not someone who builds up people. He, he takes them down. Yeah. And, you know, to some, to some people, that's attractive. Mm -hmm. That's not been Joe Biden. Joe Biden's been stayed. He's been steady. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a real com a, a contrast between the two mm -hmm. presidencies. And I think that's sometimes lost as well. Oh, Rhonda, I also want to turn to Capitol Hill and the chaos that's going on there. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of mind-boggling when you see Republicans backtracking on a bill that they negotiated. What, what are your sources telling you? Yeah, I just I put a piece on the, the Post site just moments ago where I talked to senators and they really have a lot of frustrations right now. They don't know how this uh, fell apart. They're baffled by it because, as you mentioned, this is something that in conventional times may have been very attractive to Republicans. Republicans helped craft it. It was a bipartisan bill and it's gone nowhere. So there is a lot of frustration tonight on Capitol Hill among senators. They're also looking at the House pointing fingers there, saying they told us it was dead on arrival anyway. They, they saw no ability to get this through, even though years ago this might have been able to get through. They would have celebrated it, used it for the reelection campaigns, but that's not the story on the Hill anymore. Well, Congressman, what's also interesting, though, is that we had two Democrats on the show both say that they also weren't going to vote for this. So you mm -hmm. don't just have Republicans um, saying that they don't want it, but you also now have Democrats, and not just progressive Democrats, but also Democrats who say they like some of the stuff in it. W what's your reaction to well, that? Look, I think when you you come to a big deal like this, there's going to be things you like in it and things you don't like in it. And that's just the way these, these really hard things get done. Uh, and I think, you know, and, and I'm sure Brendan's had examples of that with John Boehner back in the day. You know, difficult things, <laughs> getting across the finish line is not easy. But these Democrats won't vote for it, they say. It's not just about sort of getting, they say they would not vote for this. Look, I think there'd be bipartisan support for it and against it. Uh, and I think that's what you saw, even in terms of bills, uh, uh, when they had the tax bill up. You had far right, far left vote against it, and you had people vote for it, the moderates. It's all the reason more Republicans should be voting for it, because this is the first time that, since I've been around that we've had an immigration debate where Democrats weren't asking for legalization, they weren't asking for anything on Dreamers. This is the argument Mitch McConnell has been making. We're actually getting a lot of the stuff that we have always wanted. And if you think that you can sit around and wait for the stars to align, there to be some day when Republicans control right. everything and you get one, it's not going to happen. We actually had that in, in 2018 when we controlled all, uh, all the House, the Senate, and, and the White House. And what we ended up with was a 35-day government That's shutdown. That's exactly why some Democrats nothing. don't support it. It's exactly what you're saying, Brennan, that there are, there are things in that traditionally we have negotiated on. We haven't gotten to a deal yet, but we, we still held out hope on Dreamers and other issues that we could have a bipartisan bill. Yeah. I also want to play a little bit of sound for you, Congressman, of what President Biden had to say today. Take a listen. If the bill fails, I want to be absolutely clear about something. The American people are going to know why it failed. Every day between now and November, the American people are going to know that the only reason the border is not secure is Donald Trump and his MAGA Republican friends. How do Democrats take what happened on the Hill today um, and make it resonate with voters? Well, I think that's a start. Uh, the fact that this bill is not going to get even, you know, they, the Republican House came out and the Speaker came out in opposition to it before the language is even public. Mm -hmm. It really shows the brazen politics of this and not about the substance itself. I will give, I'll give the Republican governor of Texas this. I mean, I like this tactic, but up in New York, we realize now there's a real crisis. And Democrats may have been slow to come to the table, but we're at the table now mm -hmm. and willing to compromise and make real 
tough choices to do what's right for the security of the American people and of our government and our country. Republicans who said that's what they're all about. You want Ukraine aid? You want aid for Israel? First, we have to have a border deal. And instead, they've walked away from the table. And Rhonda, what does all of this say? And how does it, what does it pretend for a Republicans' ability to get anything done, including the fact that they can't possibly even get the votes to impeach Mayorkas? That's true. That's the other story tonight, too, that impeachment vote in the House. Um, I, I think there is a bigger story here, and it's showing the dysfunction right now in Congress. And, and how that corrects itself, I'm not sure if it would even correct itself in the next term. But you're seeing Republicans in the Senate very frustrated with House Republicans. You're seeing House Republicans stand in the way of some of their own measures. And so nothing is getting done. Uh, they seem to have two very different agendas, uh, both chambers. And, and I'm not sure how this story ends, but it is, it is a part of a bigger picture that, you know, a lot of Capitol Hill reporters like me have noticed over the last couple years is that there is a lot of dysfunction and it's leading to really nothing happening, even when it is a bill that both sides could agree on. A lot of dysfunction is one way to articulately put what's going on right now. So thank you so much, Rhonda, Joe, Brennan, for, for being with us. We'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. The news continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.